Good morning. My name is Julie Hawkins, events manager here at Winship Cancer Institute. Thank you for joining us this morning for Winship Grand Rounds. If you're at Emory University or a healthcare employee and would like to receive a CME credit hour for attending today, the login information can be found in the chat feature on the bottom of your screen. If you have any issues with this webinar or the CME login, please send me an email or drop me a note via the chat feature. This morning, we are excited to welcome Dr. Lisa Bauman Kreitzinger. Dr. Bauman Kreitzinger is an associate investigator at the Blood Research Institute of Versity and associate professor at the Medical College of Wisconsin. She specializes in non-malignant hematology with an emphasis in thrombosis. She's the medical director of the Antithrombotic Therapy Management Program at Freighter Hospital. Dr. Bauman Kreitzinger's research interests involve device-related thrombosis and venous thromboembolism or VTE. She's the co-founder of the Venus Thromboembolism Network US, a network of clinical investigators focused on VTE research. She serves on the NIH COVID-19 guideline panel and the ACCP anti-thrombotic therapy for VTE disease guideline panel. Welcome Dr. Bauman Kreitzinger. Thank you very much. I uh, appreciate the invitation uh, to present today. And we're going to talk through a couple of different aspects of device-related thrombosis uh, from catheters to VADs, and I will add in some information about stents as well. So a uh, brief conflict of interest, I was, uh, did a uh, advisory board for CSL bearing for an unrelated product, and I will not be discussing off-label use. So some learning objectives for today, I would like you to understand how device-related thrombosis differs from other different types of clots, as well as identify some prevention and management strategies for device-related thrombosis. So let's talk about how device-related thrombosis uh, differs from other types of clots. And this may seem simple at first, but um, really you do need to manage both the thrombosis, so the clot within, within the uh, vein, as well as the device, and that can lead to some challenges. So let's talk through some catheter-related thrombosis. So I'll start with the case just to frame the discussion, and I know you're not going to be able to answer it um, in this way, but think through what you would, what you would do. Um, so we have a 65-year-old female who has infective endocarditis and uh, presents with a right upper extremity swelling and pain. She has a right-sided pick for IV antibiotics. Um, and a compression ultrasound shows a right axillary and subclavian vein thrombosis. But her pick remains functional. So what's your next step in management? Do you take the pick out on the right side and put one in the left side? Do you remove the pick and you start anticoagulation? Do you just start anticoagulation? Or do you do thrombolysis and anticoagulation? So talking through the epidemiology of catheter-related thrombosis, catheter-related thrombosis is 70% of upper extremity thrombosis. If you do screening ultrasounds of people with catheters, you will have a 16 to 18% incidence of catheter-related thrombosis. But if you only look at symptomatic clots, um, about one to 5% of people with uh, lines will get a clot. And the risk factors for clots include uh, picks are more likely to have a thrombotic event compared to ports. Um, a double lumen is, has less of a likelihood of getting a clot versus triple lumen. Um, and really you can think about this as the size of the catheter versus the size of the vein in which the catheter is placed. Um, location, there was a randomized trial that looked in ICU patients based on location of the, of the um, line, and femoral lines are more likely to have a thrombotic event in compared to subclavian and IJs. And then the left side greater than the right side is more likely to have a clot. So for outcomes of catheter-related thrombosis, um, about 1 to 7 percent of people with a catheter-related thrombosis will also have a pulmonary embolism. Um, and people can get post-thrombotic syndrome of the upper extremity, just like they can of the lower extremity. And the symptoms here include pain, heaviness, cramping, and paresthesias or numb numbness and tingling. And signs uh, include uh, swelling, redness, and venous ecstasia or dilated veins in the upper uh, chest and arm. This happens in about 15% of people with catheter-related thrombosis. And if you have a residual vein thrombosis, you have a fourfold increase in risk of having post-thrombotic syndrome. And if you have post-thrombotic syndrome, you have a decreased quality of life as well as limb function. So how about catheter removal? 
So there was a prospective study of cancer patients with catheter-related thrombosis that was published many years ago, and they were treated with deltaparin and then warfarin for a total of three months. They did not have any recurrent DVT during that three-month um, anticoagulation time period, and they did not have any catheters removal, removed due to DVT extension or a dysfunction of the catheter that was resistant to interluminal DPA. So the practice point here is that you only need to remove the catheter if it's dysfunctional or you don't need it anymore. So how about thrombolysis? There is limited data about efficacy of thrombolysis in the upper extremity. In studies of catheter-related thrombosis um, that have used thrombolysis, 53% uh, of them had an initial clot resolution uh, associated with the thrombolysis, but many of them recurred uh, despite anticoagulation after the thrombolysis. So the guidelines really tell us to only do thrombolysis if the thrombosis risks outweigh the bleeding risk. And really the situation that that is is SVC syndrome, which you can see a picture of this gentleman on the right, um, where there is venous congestion due to uh, thrombosis of the SVC. So the answer to the question uh, for this patient is to start anticoagulation, especially if the PIC remains functional and you need to continue uh, with treatment. But what about if you um, can remove the, the uh, catheter? It's not needed anymore or it's not functional. Do you have to anticoagulate the patient beforehand um, before you can remove it? And really the question here is, what's the risk of pulmonary embolism after catheter removal? And we're gonna look at this uh, using a, prospective, or a retrospective multicenter cohort study that we did through the Venus em uh, Thromboembolism Network US. And Manila Gott from uh, Emory, who you all know, um, was one of the main collaborators um, and contributors to this study. So we looked at um, eight different institutions through the Venus Thromboembolism Network. And we had patients with hematologic malignancies who had a documented DVT associated with the catheter. And those patients were identified using ICD-9 and ICD-10 uh, codes. And then the data from them was extracted from the electronic medical record. You can see the patient characteristics listed here in this chart. Um, most patients had uh, leukemia, MDS, or, or a myeloproliferative neoplasm. 35% had lymphoma, and 17% had plasma cell dyscrasias. Uh, most 65% had a, had a PIC, and then you can see both tunnel catheters and ports were also present within our data set. The most proximal extent of the thrombosis is listed here in this chart, um, and you can see that 38% of them had the clot extend into the subclavian vein, 24% only had IJ thrombus, and 20% had axillary vein thrombosis. This is a breakdown of the treatment and management of, of the patients. So we had 663 patients within the uh, cohort and various management strategies were used. And again, this was a retrospective cohort study from multiple different centers. So we did not mandate what happened to these patients. Um, we just looked to see what did happen. And 19% uh, of them just had anticoagulation alone and their catheter remained in place. 59% uh, had catheter removal plus anticoagulation. 18% only had their catheter removed. And 5% uh, or 32 patients had no treatment of their catheter-related thrombosis at all. And you can see on the bottom uh, right for the catheter removal, uh, the, the biggest reason for the catheter removal actually was due to the clot. So despite what the guidelines suggest, um, people are removing the uh, catheter because of the clot itself. So in order to answer the question though of what is the risk of pulmonary embolism after catheter removal, what we did is we broke down our cohort um, into people who received anticoagulation and who did not. And in those with, who received anticoagulation, did they have um, their catheter removed delayed or they didn't have it removed at all? Or did they have early catheter removal, which we defined as greater than 48 hours um, from having the initiation of anticoagulation? So again, breaking those, those groups down, we had 200 uh, people that had anticoagulation, meaning either delayed or no removal of their, of their thrombus. We had 312 that had uh, early catheter removal and 119 that just had catheter removal. And we looked at a, a pulmonary embolism or death uh, 
within uh, seven days from diagnosis. And what we found is that these events were very rare. So we had three events in each of these categories and none of these were statistically significant differences between the groups. So overall, the, the prevalence um, or the incidence of symptomatic PE after removal of a catheter related thrombosis um, is low and it didn't differ significantly based on the timing of catheter removal. Um, and we define that as less than or greater than 48 hours in, in patients who were treated with anticoagulation. And really this data does not support a compelling reason to delay catheter removal for, for the concern of pulmonary embolism. So if you're treating with anticoagulation, then how long do you need to treat a patient? So the guidelines do say, do say an, um, anticoagulation for three months, but this is a weak recommendation and this is based on comparative studies of lower extremity thrombosis and, a pro, and the prospective cohort study that um, I discussed, uh, upper extremity DVT, then they were treated for three months. The issue is that though with these studies, um, that there isn't follow-up after the three months. So the studies were done for a total duration of three months and then, uh, and then noted the outcomes within those three months. But it's not that the patients were treated for three months and then they were followed subsequently to that to look to see what their recurrence um, rates were. And in the literature, uh, the duration of anticoagulation lasts between eight uh, days to 16 months, to greater than six months. So really what we're trying to do here is in optimizing the treatment of catheter-related thrombosis is to talk about and balance out the risk of recurrent uh, thrombosis and salvaging the catheter in compared to the risk of hemorrhage, um, the cost of anticoagulation, as well as the patient burden associated with anticoagulation. And really, I would, I would propose that we don't know what duration of anticoagulation allows those balance of risks, especially in our cancer patients. So again, getting some um, information from our uh, multicenter uh, cohort study that we completed and looking at more of the anticoagulation um, aspect of that, um, 512 patients were uh, treated with anticoagulation. Uh, again, the timeframe of, of the data that we collected was up until 26, the end of 2016. So um, most of these patients were treated with low molecular weight heparin and some were treated with unfractionated heparin or bridge to warfarin therapy. And what we found for this is that the platelet count at diagnosis differed across the treatment groups that we saw. And so in anticoagulation or anticoagulation and catheter removal, um, the platelet count uh, really was around 130 um, in comparison to people who were treated with catheter removal only or not treated at all with, with platelet counts in the 30s. And this makes sense because we, uh, we know that if patients have thrombocytopenia, that will significantly impact how we treat the patient. So the, the thrombocytopenia is a, is a reflection of their underlying malignancy and also has a significant influence on their management. We also then looked at the treatment categories and their risk of VTE recurrence and death. And the um, survival curves here are, are noted. Um, so uh, it's, if the, the curve goes down, they are having either a VTE recurrence or in the middle they're dying or all the way on the right, um, they had a death after the VTE recurrence. In, in red is anticoagulation, in green is anticoagulation plus catheter removal, purple is no treatment, and catheter removal only is in blue. And what you can see on the, on the curve on the left, all the way to the left, is that patients with catheter re, uh, removal only had the highest uh, rates of, of VTE recurrence. You can see in the middle, people with no treatment or had catheter re removal only had higher uh, death um, within the cohort. Uh, and really what that tells us is that um, it, it's not likely that, and you can see the death after the VTE recurrence over here. Um, I don't think that it's that people are necessarily dying from their VTE recurrence. What this suggests to me is the opposite. Again, we're looking for association. So um, the, it's more likely that people who are, have a poor prognosis um, from, from their malignancy are influences how uh, providers treat them. So, uh, uh, doctors are less likely to put somebody on anticoagulation 
if they have a poor prognosis from their disease, or again, it may be influenced um, by uh, thrombocytopenia as well, since those uh, are correlated also. When we looked at the duration of anticoagulation and recurrent thrombosis, there was not a difference between patients with and without recurrent thrombosis. So people average 60, 60 days in either of those categories. Um, but again, we did see that catheter removal only had an increased risk for BTE recurrence um, with a hazard ratio of 2.8. So in summary of catheter-related thrombosis, um, anticoagulation is needed. So if you can, if you can anticoagulate, you should, um, because we know that without anticoagulation, the risk of uh, recurrence is higher. Um, please keep the catheter if it's functional and you still need it. Um, and if you don't need it anymore, um, there is not necessarily an increase in PE uh, within those first seven days in the uh, patients that we saw with hematologic malignancy. Um, after a catheter removal. So let's switch gears a little bit, um, and we're gonna talk about another uh, device that we implant in patients, um, less commonly in our cancer patients, but um, in our heart failure patients, and that is uh, left ventricular assist devices. So when I'm talking about left ventricular assist devices, in case um, you are not as familiar with, the, with these devices, they break down into different types based on the type of uh, way that the blood flows uh, through the device, um, as well as then um, because of uh, the uh, flow and how the blood is propelled. So uh, the axial LVADs, we call them axial because the, um, the blood flows in an axial direction. Um, the HeartMate 2 is the device that is uh, mostly used um, within this category. It is an older device. It's not, more, it's not commonly implanted now, uh, but you will see people who have them already implanted from years prior. And the device works, uh, the, uh, the HeartMate 2 works uh, to propel blood uh, like a propeller. It looks like it works on the Archimedes screw principle and um, does uh, propel blood forward uh, using that method. Now the centrifugal LVAD devices are, are more commonly implanted uh, more recently and two devices that are currently on the market include the HVAD as well as the HeartMate 3. And the difference here is, the, is that the um, blood flow and the inflow and the outflow cannula are perpendicular to each other. So the uh, inflow cannula the, uh, is, is out here with the, with the ventricle and the blood comes in and the blood is spun around like a centrifuge. That's why they call it a, cent a centrifugal LVAD and then is shot out the end um, and is pumped uh, back into the aorta. So the, the big picture about LVAD patients is unfortunately they both bleed as well as clot. In looking at the hemorrhage uh, rates uh, in our patients, um, I did a systematic review looking at this uh, data, and the, the rates of hemorrhage are very broad, um, depending upon what uh, rates are and what definition the, the is used within the studies. So you can see here on the axial devices, perioperative bleeding 6 to 69%, in comparison to the centrifugal devices between 12 and 43%. Um, Major bleeding, again, for, uh, for the devices up to more than half of patients and the centrifugal device is up to 44%. The Momentum 3 trial is the most recent trial that was uh, published within, with LVADs and patients were randomized between having a HeartMate 2 implanted versus the HeartMate 3 implanted. And you can see the rates of, of bleeding here include uh, about 15% of patients with uh, GI hemorrhage, um, and 14, 10 to 14% with surgical bleeding. Now let's contrast that to the thrombotic events that we see within these patients. Um, and again, the rates are lower. So we have up to uh, 12 to 13% in the axial devices, 12 to 28% in the centrifugal devices, whether we're looking at ischemic stroke versus pump thrombosis. Um, in the Momentum 3 trial, uh, we had ischemic stroke rates of six and, uh, five and 6%. Um, within the devices. But where the difference may, uh, came for these devices is that for the pump thrombosis on the HeartMate 2 was at 10% um, versus none at, with the HeartMate 3. 
HeartMate 3 device has had subsequent uh, patients that have been reported that have had a pump thrombotic event. So it's not that the device is, is immune to having a pump thrombosis, but we didn't see it initially in the randomized trial. And although the, so you look at these numbers and, you're, and you say, well, but the bleeding events are much higher than the, than the thrombotic events, why is this such a problem? And, and the issue with the thrombotic events is that is the significant um, morbidity and mortality associated with them. Um, of course, ischemic stroke usually has a significant morbidity associated with it. And from a pump thrombotic event, um, this most often requires the, the device to be explanted. Um, or a significant amount of thrombolysis and other things used to treat it. So um, an explant of, a, of an LVAD requires a median sternotomy and um, in, a, in a setting of uh, a, a redo, because um, they've already had one to implant it. So it is a pretty significant surgical procedure that is required. Um, and so the, the thrombotic events are something that we really do try to prevent because of the significant morbidity and mortality um, associated with them. So again, um, I know I'm speaking to, to many hematologists, uh, but just to kind of frame the how we think about um, hemostasis and thrombosis in these patients. Um, again, ble bleeding is a failure of hemostasis, um, or you really uh, a blood vessel hole that doesn't get plugged if, um, correctly. So in, in our LVAD patients, uh, we really do have multiple different ways we put holes in the patients. So um, there's major surgery, as I talked about, um, with a median sternotomy. Um, and then many of our patients will have abnormal vessel formation. Um, and we do see that in our patients uh, in the GI tract as well as in the, in the nose with um, AVMs that are formed. And there also is a lack of a plug a lot of times. So there is surgical bleeding. So I, I, my surgeons don't like to hear that, but um, there can be missing suture and you may need to go back and, and place some suture. Um, there is deficient or abnormal von Willebrand factor and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, and deficient to abnormal platelets and you can also have deficient coagulation factors as well. Especially we do that with warfarin therapy um, for prevention of thrombosis. And thrombosis is, is fibrin formation in an abnormal place. And we know that uh, in order to get fibrin you need thrombin and we can get thrombin in multiple different ways um, and different activation pathways, especially with our LVADs. So there is platelet activation um, in our patients and you get factor V release as well as the membrane in which clotting can form. Um, you can get tissue factor and um, this is from the subendothelium um, that's released during trauma and surgery um, as well as microparticles and activated white blood cells. And there can be contact activation. Um, you are placing a very large uh, amount of metallic surface into a patient when you put in an LVAD, and there's a lot of shear associated with uh, propelling blood to pump it. Um, there can be immune complexes, um, especially in the, in the setting of, of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, um, polyphosphates, as well as neutrophil extracellular traps. So when we look at, instead of it in a kind of pathway, we look at it in a list of how um, the coagulation system works. You can have platelets, you need to have platelets bind to von Willebrand factor. You need to have platelets be activated. You need to have coagulation factors be activated, um, thrombin formed to fibrin, and then you have fibrinolysis. Um, and each of these aspects is dysregulated in, in patients with left ventricular cyst devices. There's impaired platelet von Willebrand factor binding, and there were some elegant studies that looked at um, a, a combination of, of patient platelets and normal platelets and, and patient von Willebrand factor and, and normal, von, um, normal von Willebrand factor and normal plasma. And really it showed that there was a combined defect here, that it's not just, um, there is an acquired von Willebrand disease. Um, people will lose high molecular weight multimers of von Willebrand factor, um, but there does seem to be a platelet binding defect as well. Um, in most of the assays, there is some debate within the literature, but in most of the studies, it does suggest that platelets are activated um, in our patients with left ventricular cyst devices. Um, initially, there is some decrease in contact pathway factors um, after implant. And you will see both thr thrombin uh, formation increased as well as fibrinolytic activation. So you will see increase in um, TATs and um, as well as D-dimers uh, in our patients with left ventricular cyst devices.
So when I was brought into this, uh, into this work um, and, and issues with, with pump thrombosis were happening, um, people asked me, how, how can I prevent this? How can I, how can I treat this? What do I need to do? And my question back to them, well, is what clot, what type of clot is this? Um, because we know how uh, to treat arterial clots. Um, there's many, 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 many randomized trials of how we treat arterial thrombosis, especially in the coronary arteries. And we know how to treat, um, how do we treat venous clots? And so really um, trying to understand what type of clot um, was present uh, was fundamental to trying to, to actually treat it. So realized um, looking into the literature that we really didn't know um, what type of clot the LVAD um, was getting. So we, so we tried to figure it out. Um, so fortunately I was able to, to collaborate with uh, the group at the University of Louisville and Mark Slaughter, and they had a, a uh, bank of their of their clots um, that were removed from HeartMate three, or excuse me, HeartMate two um, devices, and we were able to to uh, look at the immunohistochemistry of that based upon where uh, the clot was pulled from, um, and you can see there really is a, a difference in the immunohistochemistry. So the the clots that happen at the elbows or these bends um, in the device really look more um, diffuse. There's much more. Um, space within them, they're not as tightly compact. Whereas the in the um, actually the propeller itself, in the rotor itself, um, the device is uh, the the clots are much more compact, um, as you can see here in the inlet bearing, the rotor veins, as well as the outlet stator. So these are just different parts of the of the uh, propeller and um, the differences in the devices. So I did focus on the. Um, the inlet rotor uh, devices. And the reason for that is that we had, we knew based upon what the clot looked like, where the device was, and what was in the blood. Um, and the reason for that, you can see here in uh, what, what is noted as the asterisk, um, that's where the, 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 the bearing, um, the ruby tip of the rotor is. Um, so we knew that the device was, was lining that, and this really looked like a donut the clot looked like a donut um, around that rotor. And what we could do then is look to see um, what are, is there, is there a, a difference um, in, in the layering of, of these clots? And, and that's what we saw. So this um, Matias scarlet blue staining really looks for both um, fibrin formation and collagen. Um, but what you can also see uh, with that is that these, these layers are different. Um, and uh, with the different colorings as well as the different um, composition. Looking into that a little bit more with um, immunohistochemistry, again, the Martyr Scarlet Blue here is all the way on the left, and you can see the difference um, between, between that in comparison to the um, elbow clots. Um, and what we can see when we look at fibrin, fibrin fibrinogen, immunohistochemistry, and von Willebrand factor staining um, is that is that the, uh, the clots are really mostly fibrin clots at that point in time, um, and, and some von Willebrand factor. Um, and in the, uh, the, the other, the elbow clots, there is both fibrin, fibrinogen, as, as well as von Willebrand factor um, in higher amounts, um, and as well as then they also have significant platelet deposition within, within these um, elbow clots as well. However, the um, inlet bearing thrombus really don't have significant platelet deposition. So the only places that we saw platelet deposition were really on the outside of, of, the, of, the, of the rings of the, of the clots here. Um, and very limited, um, any, if any, there were none on these inlet um, clots at all, believe me, I tried. I tried to, fi I tried to find them and they were, were not present there. So some mechanistic inferences from this um, the majority of the heart matrix round by formed on the rotor with different layers. Um, and the inference that we can, that we can make from that is that it suggests that thrombi then occur over time. Um, and we see that most of the thrombi are composed of fibrinogen and von Willebrand factor. Um, and especially on the fibrinogen part of that, you know, the, it really is the suggestion is to, to treat and target anticoagulation for that. Um, the presence of platelets is limited to the outside ring of the thrombus, 
And what this uh, suggests is that the platelets are involved in propagation and, and may be less likely involved in the initiation events of, of the clot formation. So there's, there's many uh, uh, limitations to, to this data. Um, the thrombi are removed from the device after, after shipping. So, um, so it is, uh, the devices were taken out, they were then shipped to the manufacturer and, and the manufacturer then removed the clots. So is it possible that there was some degradation of, of some of the cells that were present um, to the point that they weren't seen by immunohistochemistry? Yes, that's definitely possible. Um, and this was also a single solder study, so it's possible that you know, the, the patients that we took care of at the University of Louisville um, are different than other, than other centers and the clots would therefore look different. Um, we really couldn't, uh, except for the ones that were really stuck to the rotor, um, and you could tell that they were then re removed from the rotor itself, it's hard to distinguish, was a clot suctioned in from somewhere else and then just got stuck in the device, or did it actually form in the device itself? Um, and probably the biggest thing is that uh, the limitation here is that uh, the clot tells us the end. It tells us how, what things looked like at the, uh, when, it, when it was big enough and, and, bat, and the clot was um, more, most impactful that it needed to be taken out. So it doesn't necessarily tell us, it gives us some inferences and some suggestions, but doesn't tell us for sure how the clot initiated and developed from there. Um, the samples were de-identified, so it's not that we could go back to the, to the patients in uh, charts and say, okay, for this patient that had uh, four rings in, in their uh, device, uh, they had three other times pr pr prior to the time that it was taken out that they had um, issues with the device, um, there were alarms, and that um, then it got better, and then we went on and had, a, had multiple episodes along the way. So ideally, that's what, what we would see, but um, we weren't able to do that with, with this sample. And lastly, we didn't compare it to different device thrombi, so um, we don't know if it is similar to other devices as well. So what do we do um, for our patients? So most patients will come to, um, to Alvent implant antiquagulated, um, about half of them will, and most of them will be on aspirin. Um, they're treated with cardiopulmonary bypass and therefore treated with heparin. Um, and heparin is most often used um, in the uh, post-operative setting um, as bridging uh, that started off slower, lower, and then gradually increased up. Um, and there's different, there's the guidelines um, in the LVAD realm suggest APTTs um, ranges, but we know um, from hematology that that is uh, not universal. Um, APTT ranges are not correlated ar uh, across institutions. Um, aspirin then is, is used uh, in our patients. And then after test tube removal, warfarin is used. So we're, you know, we have multiple different other anticoagulants. So can we use those in patients with left ventricular assist devices? Um, and there has been a randomized control trial in patients with left ventricular assist devices. And they randomized patients to dabigatran um, versus warfarin. And this was stopped early, um, only after 16 patients. Uh, because what they found is that half of the patients who were treated with the bigotran had a thromboembolic event um, compared to one patient with warfarin. Um, so the bigotran should not be used um, in our patients with left ventricular assist devices. So um, vitamin K antagonist treatment is standard. An average uh, goal INR range is from two to three um, within the literature. Now, uh, it's not that people aren't trying, and there just, uh, there just was a, uh, a case series of patients treated with apixaban and rivaroxaban, seven patients um, that were reported in the, in the literature uh, a couple of months ago. And really what they found, they took patients who had a very, very low time and therapeutic range of only 30%, um, and they instead treated them with apixaban and rivaroxaban and then looked back and compared the time frame of the uh, amount of complications that they had while they were on um, apixaban and complications that they had um, while they were on warfarin and they suggested similar rates. Again, these were only seven patients and so there, the, there's no power to, to say that these are similar um, statistically. 
And so I would really, I would very heavily caution people um, against doing this unless there's a study um, or there's significant counseling of a patient of potential risk. So when we look about INR intensity, um, the, uh, based on a, this was a single center retrospective review that looked at 149 patients with a median follow-up of 17.6 months. And they had a very nice curve here of looking at rates of hemorrhage and thrombosis by INR um, and found uh, this perfect U-shaped curve. Um, and, 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 and really that the optimum INR is 2.6. So again, that, that two to three range is what we want. And this should not be surprising to any of us since, since we know that that's the range that we use in atrial fibrillation, um, unless somebody has a mechanical valve. Um, and it's what we use also in VTE. So um, again, it, it suggests warfarin two to three is what we should be doing for, for these patients. But people are trying something different, of course, um, and trying to see if, if things can be optimized. And really the thought here is the heart mate three is suggested, it, um, uh, at least from the pump thrombosis realm, to have a uh, lower risk of thrombosis. And so can we target an, a lower INR intensity for the heart mate three? And so this was a study that was done with 15 patients. Um, and they used six weeks of an INR of uh, two to three with aspirin, and then they dropped the INR goal to 1.5 to 1.9. And the primary endpoint here was survival of three, free of pump thrombosis, disabling stroke or major bleeding, and um, at, at least up to six months. They had one recurrent GI bleed within six months, and they just, they just published um, a, the follow-up cohort from this and saw that there were no pump thrombotic events or strokes at 18 months. But again, 15 patients. Um, and and a, if, if you are going to do something different um, for your patients, uh, please, I, I would suggest to do it on trial so at least we can gather data um, within the literature about risk and benefit uh, of whatever regimen that you're, you are attempting to use. And, and this is the, the part that um, I wanna caution people about. Um, when we look at the thrombotic outcomes in somewhat of a timeline, so HeartMate 2 um, can be used as a bridge to transplant. And when we look at those patients, their rate of ischemic stroke was 6% at six months and the pump thrombotic event was 2% at six months. Um, and when we look at patients who are not eligible for um, heart transplant, um, extreme stroke rates, they look at two years in these patients, was 8% at two years, and pump thrombosis was 4% at two years. And then came 2014 when we started to see an increase in pump thrombotic events of 7% at six months. And then, as I mentioned in the most recent randomized trial, the HeartMate 2 had a 6% uh, thrombosis at six months of ischemic stroke, excuse me, and a 10% um, pump thrombotic events and comparing that to the HeartMate 3 device, uh, suggesting that there is less of a pump thrombos thrombosis rates for these patients. But the thing to, to point out here is the ischemic stroke rate looks very similar um, um, across all of these devices. And so the, although there may be some differences within the pump thrombosis for these patients, ischemic stroke does seem to be the same. And we really do need to figure out um, why uh, patients still are having ischemic stroke rates and if those can be uh, modulated in any other way. So talking about management of therapy, um, all that patients do have a low time and therapeutic range and this may be a, a reason for why they're having other events. Um, and in a systematic review, their time and therapeutic range is 46%. And if you have a good time and therapeutic range, their, their decreased hemorrhage or thrombosis events. This again should not be uh, surprising to us as, as this is what we see with atrial fibrillation and VTE as well. Um, if you have pharmacists run in a coagulation, you will have improvement in your time and therapeutic range. And home, home monitoring also has been shown to increase their time and therapeutic range because you increase their time and the number of measurements that you use. And there recently was a, a trial um, from the Vienna group that looked at if you do daily INR measurements versus three times a week, um, there was a, an improvement in time and therapeutic range as well. And people who were well controlled were more likely to be measuring daily. And if you were well controlled, there were less intracranial hemorrhages as well. So the better you can control your patients, the better that they will do.
Now, how about how about um, uh, antiplatelet agents? And there really is variable use of here of, of this. Most people most people will use um, antiplatelet therapies, uh, and uh, and it does uh, suggest aspirin versus dipertamol. Um, in an analysis of the Momentum 3 trial, there really showed no differences in outcomes in, in dosing of the aspirin. Um, so 30, 325 milligrams of aspirin versus 81 milligrams of aspirin um, within that. And their survival free from hemorrhage and thrombosis was similar uh, between those groups. There are a couple of uh, registries that do look at patients who are not treated with aspirin. And so the EU TRACE study is, is of uh, centers where vitamin K antagonist therapy is the standard of care. So this is a different group of patients. So these centers, everybody just gets um, vitamin K antagonists, and they had pretty low um, stroke rates and device thrombosis rates. Um, you can compare that though to the e, uh, U.S. Uh, cohort, uh, and this was uh, this was a bleeding cohort. So people were enrolled in this if they had a bleeding event and they were gonna be treated some uh, differently in some way. So either vitamin K antagonist alone, aspirin alone, or no therapy at all. And 82% um, of them were enrolled again because of bleeding. And you can see that the ischemic stroke rate and the device thrombosis rates were higher than the EU um, study. And about 52% of them had subsequent bleeding. So what this suggests to us, um, it really is that people will, you have, you, you have bleeders, right? So you have people who have bled are more likely to bleed again in, in the future. There has been a randomized trial that has been completed that looked at the, um, in HeartMate two patients, um, aspirin versus placebo. There've been 72 patients randomized and we are waiting results um, from that. So the summary of LVADs, um, warfarin is your standard of care and your time and therapeutic range is essential. Um, to, to reduce the risk of, of events for that. And aspirin is routinely used, but we don't necessarily know the most appropriate dose or if it's required at all. So one quick, a uh, couple of quick slides here on stents. Um, I, I told Dr. Kempton I would, I would uh, uh, look at a couple of um, information from stents. So fortunately, um, on the, uh, from the vascular surgery side, um, many of the organizations have come together and put out a global guideline. Um, so this is for the European Society, the Society of Vascular Surgery in the US and the World Federation of Vascular Societies, which has a lot of other um, country societies in it, came together and did a global guideline of antithrombotic therapy after endovascular stents. So these again are arterial stents. Um, so what they said is that for chronic limb threatening ischemia, um, we should be treating patients with antiplatelets and with a 1A recommendation, and clopidogrel is, perf is preferred for these patients, um, but that had a lower, uh, lower amount of evidence and, and grading there. Um, you can consider uh, aspirin and rivaroxaban at 2.5 milligrams twice a day based on the COMPASS data showing lower um, the cardiothrombotic or cardioembolic um, events in these patients. And what they did, what they said for sure, is not to use warfarin to treat the atherosclerosis. So many of the um, guidelines within this are to treat the atherosclerosis. So it's about diabetes management and hypertension management and quitting smoking. Um, but what they what they did with a strong recommendation is say we don't use warfarin to treat the the atherosclerosis and chronic limb threatening ischemia. So how about revascularization? So somebody who actually had a stent um, put in. Um, so after an infra, um, infrainguinal prosthetic bypass, so they suggested aspirin plus clopidogrel for six to 24 months. Um, if it's just an endovascular intervention, they suggested at least a month of dual antiplatelet therapy. And if somebody had repeated catheter-based um, um, interventions, the dual antiplatelet therapy is recommended for one to six months. But what you can see here is this is two, um, two B or two C recommendations because of the limited evidence um, that supports them. So what do people do? So there was a survey that was that was published, an um, international survey uh, published last year, that looked at antithrombotic therapy um, and based on procedure type. And what you can see is that there are some differences based on what um, the patient does. So monotherapy with um, one antiplatelet alone, um, or or an antiplatelet or an anticoagulant, um, is uh, is highest in balloon angioplasty and goes down um, if any stenting is, is used. 
and dual uh, uh, therapy is used in most uh, of those. Um, direct oral coagulants are in a very light blue and, and is not present in, in many of these. And warfarin is in a, a uh, yellow. And so that's only really present um, in a very limited amount in the drug eluting stents. Um, and there also is a difference based on location here. So all the way on the left is iliac and in the tibial is, is on the right. So you're going from large, vein, or large arteries to small arteries. And you can see that the amount of monotherapy goes down as you go to a smaller uh, vessel and the amount of dual antiplatelet therapy goes up. So a quick summary of, of this, really anti th antiplatelet therapy uh, for arterial endovascular stents is, is what, what is used and what is recommended. And really we do need, we do need trials here and studies here. So some take home points on device related thrombosis is unique. Um, due to the need to prevent um, and manage both the thrombosis as well as the device itself. And we heard that both from a catheter-related thrombosis as well as the LVADs. Um, and really, we, I, I would propose that we need to understand the mechanism of thrombosis in order to understand how to best prevent and treat uh, these devices and these clots. And especially in, in stents, if, if you want a, a research project and you collaborate well with your uh, vascular surgeons or interventional radiologists, this is a ripe area for need um, for uh, trials. And with that, I will leave you with a, another picture of one of our LVAD um, clots, and I will take any questions. Thank you so much. If you have questions, please use the Q&A feature located at the bottom of your screen. Um, I want to apologize. There were some issues with the CME uh, login. The correct code is now up in the chat area. So you can access that if you need to submit to receive your CME credit. While we wait on questions, uh, please plan to join us next week as our grand round speaker will be Dr. Manaj Bazan from Emory University who will be speaking on single cell omics, unraveling disease and therapeutic responses one cell at a time. To view all upcoming Winship Grand Rounds lectures, please visit the Grand Rounds page on the Winship Cancer Center website or the Winship calendar. Let's see if we get any questions to pop up. Let's give it a minute. Here we go. We had a couple pop up. Um, so the first one I see here is um, what about the role of thrombophilia testing um, or anticoagulation management of dialysis, uh, dialysis actual, excess fistula clots? Oh, yeah. Um, there is, there's not great, um, there's not great data um, as you would expect uh, in this. Again, another, another area uh, for, for um, study that needs to be done. Um, the problem is that uh, we know that our patients with uh, needing dialysis have, have very high um, factor eight levels, um, and, and that's pretty universal for these patients, but whether that influences their risk for thrombosis. Um, the, in, practically speaking, I, I don't know of any studies that look at, the, at, that look at this, but practically speaking, um, what I do in my practice is I do look for antiphospholipid antibodies. Um, at times if there is recurrent thrombosis, um, because that also will impact potential how we handle transplant um, for these patients. Um, and then from, from the other thrombophilias, I do look at sort of other risk factors, um, you know, do they have a family history and other things. But um, I, I agree, Dr. God, that is, a, that is a good question and maybe something that we should be, be looking at through Venus um, as well. Um, Dr. Kempton, um, so what do I think about the failure of dabigatran compared with warfarin and LVAD? Says either about the differences between dabigatran and warfarin or the type of clotting in LVAD versus um, BTE. Another great question. Um, and and I, think, I think it's a, it's a possibility of two, of a combination of things. Um, one is that um, the, the main difference between any of our direct oral anticoagulants um, and warfarin is the trough. So, um, so our director of anticoagulants will have a trough every day. Um, and it's possible that then that trough level is an insufficient uh, amount to um, outweigh the coagulation system activation locally. 
So there, there is a suggestion and there, there is some good um, data uh, about this, especially in, in valves, about that um, there is a direct thrombin activation at the site that is not able to be overwhelmed with dabigatran. Um, and and uh, so I think it's both a combination of that the device itself is causing contact activation and therefore local thrombin generation um, that then the dabigatran and then I also subsequently worry about uh, these patients with um, apixaban or rivaroxaban that the trough levels may be too low in order to protect them um, from thrombosis there. Um, next question. Um, about uh, upper extremity thrombosis dis differently if it's distal versus proximal, axillary versus subclavian. Um, I don't. Um, I think a, 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 I think we are concerned if they if it extends even more centrally. So if it extends into the SVC, um, but in general, I, I don't tend to manage the the clot differently if it's in the um, you know, so axillary, so plebeian um, uh, versus others. I think one important part that I didn't put in the talk, but, and, and you may already know, but um, just as a reminder, and we've had to discuss this in our, in our institution as well, um, about what, what a superficial vein is. Um, because many of our picks are put into the, the basilic or the cephalic. And, um, and so if that's the only, location that is clotted, that is still a superficial vein. Um, it is not a deep vein. And, and therefore, you can manage those differently um, uh, with that. So uh, I, I've definitely been um, called about lots of, you know, basilic vein thrombosis and, and, and how to manage that and, and, it can, uh, and needing to remind people that those are actually superficial veins. Uh, Dr. Lee. Um, so uh, it moved up. So sorry. Did do I think that anti von Willebrand factor therapies would be effective in treating LVAD link thrombosis? Is there a planned study? Um, yeah, it's a great question. Uh, so the uh, the things that have been looked at from an anti um, VWF perspective so far. Um, have been more on um, the, the bleeding side and trying to uh, either mitigate um, the uh, acquired von Willebrand syndrome that is present. And so people have looked at um, doxycycline because of the um, uh, uh, issues with or the inhibition of Adam TS13. Um, with that, um, uh, they have also looked at um, other ways, you know, do we use von Willebrand factor concentrate? I just had a had a discussion with the treatment side. Um, yeah, that would, you know, whether uh, if we, you know, had a, you know, infusional capacity to, for example, put in um, Adam TS13 or something to that effect, um, that could we, that could be tried. Um, in addition to maybe thrombolysis um, for those patients. I think with the, what we saw definitely for sure with the LVAD clots themselves um, is that the, you know, they're very, the ones that are on the rotor are very densely packed. And so getting through those is pretty, is pretty difficult. You could definitely probably get through those outer. Oh, good. I think it's still, <laughs> somebody says we can still hear you. I, I appreciate it. There was, there was something that came up that said we were, that we got cut off. So yeah, I'll take a look so here. Sorry. That's okay. Um, so yes, I think, I, I think the, the issue with LVAD um, related thrombosis also um, is that, and, and actually, you know, we, we, we experienced this though with our bleeding disorders, right? When rare, you know, we have to have many, many, many institutions um, participating for rare events. So when we when we do a study in hemophilia, you know, there needs to be uh, 50 centers, 20, 50 centers, because each center is only going to enroll a couple of patients. Um, and similarly, uh, thankfully, it seems with the HeartMate 3 device and even with the HVAD device, the, the rates that each of these devices are, are clotting um, 
seems to be lower, especially um, anecdotally, um, as well as what was happening back in 2013 and 2014. Um, so we would have to have a very large multi-center, um, multi, you know, probably international study um, for each, each center to have um, only one or two um, events that happen. So I think it's possible. I think it's probably what is required because what's in the literature now is a limited number of, of cases per institution. And um, that way, the, um, then it's really hard then to take a look at that and, and compare it across institutions and across strategies. Thank you so much. I apologize for the interruption there. That was bizarre. Um, but, but thank you so much for your presentation today. We really appreciate it. And uh, we'll see everybody next week. Perfect. Thank you.